we have uh, Brian Ross, who's going to be talking about investing in the tourism and hospitality sector. Brian uh, is a dual role within Prospero, focuses on ensuring effective overall delivery of the company's strategy and phys- facilitating investments to drive inclusive growth of MSME, micro SMEs even, uh, within Zambia tourism. Uh, so that if you're in the tourism space, I'm sure there'll be many discussions. And one of the questions that came up this morning was, you know, what happens in the time of COVID? How can we come out of thing if you're in the tourism and hospi- hospitality sectors? You know, what are some of the strategies you need to be looking at uh, to support and grow your business? Let's just kick off. I'm, I mean, I'm really interested to kind of get some perspectives uh, from from our panelists and and. Uh, get some senses about where they where they see the industry coming from and where they see the industry going. So, Ntanda, ladies, why don't I could I just kick off with you with you both and and ask kind of what what you're seeing from from the travel agent side uh, in terms of kind of a a post COVID recovery. Is is there what's the trajectory that you're seeing? And don't forget to uh, un, unmute yourself either, please. Um, hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, I, to be honest with you, last year wasn't a bad year for us because we just expanded on our local market, which we've always had. Um, we just made sure we got more clients and and certainly learnt about some newer destinations that and newer lodges, smaller lodges that we weren't that aware of before. Um, in saying that, I think this year is going to be a lot tougher. Um, so I, I don't know where some agents are going to end up this year. I'd, I'd like to hope. It kind of looks to me that there's a lot of new ones from last year. Yes. I don't know how many are going to be around at the end of this year of the newbies, if I can put it that way. Cam? Lillian, it's, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for uh, making the time. Uh, and, and as I, I mentioned er, a bit earlier that uh, you were the director of tourism with the Ministry of Tourism and Arts. And, and maybe it might, I could direct my next question at you. Uh, just to, you know, we've, we've been kind of chatting about just the, the general COVID impact at the moment. And, and you know, obviously in, in the context of ICA and, and looking at investment opportunities and looking at how we can support impact investment in, in Zambia. Um, maybe you could just kind of briefly outline some of the ministry, you know, what the ministries take on on kind of COVID recovery, you know, of the tourism sector and, and what your priorities are. Um, and I think that could then help to kind of facilitate uh, some follow up questions for, for the rest of our panel. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, apologies, yeah. I I start I got in late, so I was trying to figure out how to join in. So thank you for considering the ministry to be part of this uh, discussion. What I would say is that uh, the ministry is um, really taking keen interest in this uh, COVID and uh, ensuring that the sector recovers. So you may know that uh, through the Zambia Tourism Agency, we developed uh, safety protocols which guide the industry so that we don't have spread of the disease. We limit the spread. We give guidelines as to how the the sector can respond and harmonize uh, the responses. And also to to mention that uh, through the Ministry of Health, you know that the time period has now been reduced for the certification the, set, the validity from 14 days to seven days. We also have adopted mitigation measures for the sector. The 2021 budget outlines uh, measures that will help the sector some relief and also to see whether the sector can attract some investment. So we have measures to do with the uh, corporate tax, which has been reduced, it's now 15% reduced from 35%. We have time to pay in terms of income tax, value added tax. We also have uh, suspension of some uh, fees. Uh, Enterprise uh, fees have been suspended for a period of one year and renewal fees. We have um, the duty removed on some type of uh, transport for the tourism sector. 
This is in addition to what is already been given in the economic recovery plan. 2020 to 2023, we have an economic recovery plan that is managed through the Ministry of Finance. So other measures that the ministry has taken include the empowerment uh, facility for the youth. We, we know that uh, these funds were dispersed sometime uh, last year. So the idea is to see how it's a revolving fund, hopefully that once the others that have gotten hold of the monies will be able to, to pay back, then others who, who may not have been considered then will be able to get on board. And then as part of the global community, we are part of the UNWTO crisis uh, committee, where we are looking at responses, harmonized responses to, 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 to COVID. For instance, there's now a discussion on uh, vaccines. How do we ensure that the sector is considered as a priority in terms of access to the vaccine so that we do not, uh, uh, delay the recovery of, of, of the sector. So we have met submissions through the Ministry of Health to consider the tourism sector as one of the priority areas. We have also requested for support through UNDP to do an assessment, a comprehensive assessment of the impact of uh, COVID on the tourism sector. And the outcome of that assessment will lead to the development of the recovery plan. So this is where we are as a ministry in terms of uh, considerations on COVID-19. Great. Thank you very much. That, that really does contextualize. I mean, clearly, the, you know, everyone in the industry really has felt the impact, but that helps contextualize, you know, what opportunities are there. It, you know, at least for kind of, you know, those already in the sector and those looking to get into the sector. So that's, that's helpful. Uh, Paula, could I, could I turn to you and just, and just kind of ask, you know, based on your, I mean, you, you are involved in a kind of a niche subsector uh, of, the Tam, of the Zambian, you know, offer, you know, more on the adventure, kind of outdoors adventure side, but less on the safari. Can you, what are you thinking for, you know, for opportunities and what, what are you seeing as kind of, growth areas uh, within the Zambian tour offer, you know, as, as this post COVID era kind of continues to grow? Yeah, um, well, one of the major opportunities that we have is that it's a completely undeveloped market at the moment. And what we can prove is that there's appetite for it regionally, even globally. Um, some of the, the information that we get on adventure tourism is really encouraging. Um, especially people from Europe are very willing to spend money on doing physical activities as part of a holiday. Um, the other huge opportunity we have in Zambia is we've just got these amazing wild landscapes that people would love to hike and ride in. Um, there is some infrastructure that we'd need to, to um, develop. It's also a, a product that could be a really great case study for community immersion and um, economic empowerment with rural communities as well. Um, operating these adventure, um, adventure tourism products is relatively low cost um, in that you're not building a lodge or doing anything like that. You're generally hiking and camping and things like that. So there are opportunities to involve communities as well. Um, but I'd say the major opportunity for us is we have a blank canvas currently um, and and it's proven that um, there's appetite for the product. So we just need to develop it and bring it to market. Thanks. That's, uh, that's also been my experience. You know, I think there's so much uh, opportunity out there that many uh, people are, are unaware of. Um, and so, you know, the work that Prospero is doing really, especially in fo focused on kind of getting more Zambian entrepreneurs into the sector itself. I think, you know, as we engage, you know, many would be kind of investors and entrepreneurs in Zambia uh, and talk about kind of the market opportunities. We see a lot of, you know, surprise that that, you know, it's it doesn't necessarily need to be a capital intensive. It's like you're not you don't you don't have to you don't have to get a big concession in a national park and you don't have to big a, build a big five star lodge. There's lots of. Um, ways for investors to be involved on, on a smaller scale as you know smaller add-on products or smaller niche products that can be that can be built into larger packages um, and and that 
that brings me to my next my next question or comment. And I see I see Rodney Sakumba's joined us. So Rodney, if I could uh, if I could direct uh, my next question at you and just get your take on what areas of kind of the tourism value chain are most overlooked by entrepreneurs in Zambia and and where there might be able uh, you know be opportunity for for investment and market engagement. Well, thank you very much, Bran, and, and apologies for joining the round table late. Uh, I think this initiative is actually very welcome and timely at the time that the tourism sector seems to have been hard hit and we seem not to have any clue on what to do next. Now, to answer your question, Brian, I, I think for, for, for a long time now, we've realized that the tourism sector has been overlooked by a lot of locals, uh, not because they don't know what it is, but I think it's, it, it seems to be more of a, of, of, of a market that is only attracting foreign investors. Now, why I say so is, uh, if you go around Zambia today, in most of these um, tourism development areas, be it Livingstone, Lower Zam, Kafue National Park, South Luangwa, and those other nice places, you'd find that the only people who get to invest are the foreign investors. We welcome that. It's fantastic. We get a lot of skews from that. <clears throat> but quite frankly, I think it's about time that our locals start to participate in the tourism sector. Why I say so is number one. We, we've, we've already seen what has happened during COVID. COVID itself has, has taught us a lesson. COVID itself has shown us that in the absence of those foreign tourists coming into Zambia, we have ourselves, was to see how best we could reduce the investment threshold. Uh, from the tradition of $500,000 uh, to get an investment permit. You know, there's clearly opportunities for, uh, you know, a need for tra continuous training development, um, programming. I've talked with a few people who, are, who have kind of been interested in looking at this as a potential investment. Um, you know, schools, commercially run schools that could then feed feed employees into the tourism industry um, with a great, with a higher level of skills. And I think that's something that we, we commonly see in, or hear from the private sector as, as, a, as an overall market constraint in Zambia. Um, so there's clearly opportunities for investment on that. Um, Rodney, maybe I could turn to you quickly and, you know, and just someone like Frederick who, who's interested in, 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 you know, entering into the tourism sector uh, you know, even at the, even as a small scale investor or a small scale entrepreneur, what what would you uh, suggest? You know, just in, just in kind of a thirty second or a one minute soundbite, as as an effective way for someone like him to uh, to make that initial step. Can I butt in? Yeah, Try please. And... Um, it, it's it's just some very small, simple ideas, um, which is in one of the questions. So you can't ask me again later. Um, but, there, but there are, and I think I've mentioned some of them to you before, I think people would even be interested in culinary local experiences, let's say in places like Lusaka. Um, so you, you may know how to cook local food very well, or your granny or your auntie, and have access to lots of local product. You don't have the money. Go and team up with a, with a restaurant in town. Um, to say, can we do this on a Wednesday? And you advertise it, you bring the people and you get a cut. Um, or, or go and learn about your city and become a city guide. Um, I, I think there's opportunity for packages to be put together with the train from Lusaka to Livingston. It's a very affordable way of getting people there. Um, and, and I certainly think, cert and, and a COVID's just brought it to the front, Zambians have never traveled Zambia in their lives like they have done in the last 10 months. Um, I, think, I think Zambians know more about their country now than even a 50 year old has probably learned in the last 50 years because they've been forced to go on holiday locally. So there are little opportunities, you know, go and buy the train tickets, get the packed lunch, which, you know, if you don't have a food certificate, go and get crisps and seal stuff from ShopRite, put it in a picnic basket and say it includes a picnic lunch. It hasn't cost you a lot of money. So there are opportunities uh, out there. <laughs> I think that's quite interesting. Uh, and, and I fully agree with you on that, you know, some of the urban tourism opportunities like the food yeah. tours, 
like some of the you know cultural tours at, at different historic sites that really have a market uh, that such so few people know about. You know, uh, NHCC these sites that are dotted around the country, some of them are truly spectacular that no one really knows much about because they're not, you know, they're not marketed on a high level or they're not, or they're quite remote and not included in packages from travel agents. Like, you know, the logistics, um, the, the transport's a big opportunity. We're seeing Samphia as, as kind of a destina yeah. domestic destination really start to take off, which is very exciting. Uh, and I yeah, think it's that's very, quite difficult to work with as operators, yeah. Sam, anybody in Sam. Extremely. Yeah. <laughs> why is that? What's what are the what are the challenges that you're seeing? You can well, only book the main direct. thing is they're all on Booking.com. Um, but will they give an agent commission? No. And, and we'd say very nicely, agents normally get ten percent, and then you'll see them on all these OTAs giving away fifteen and twenty percent. Um, which which makes me mad because the money's going outside, it's not staying inside. Um, and I think if they had a hundred local travel agencies marketing them, they wouldn't. They probably wouldn't need an would OTA. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, to me. That's a very interesting insight into the industry. I think you know that's we're Prospero is planning to go up and do some more work in in Sampia and really start to look at it as as part of a wider you know wider Northern Circuit development. Uh, and, and something like that, you know, greater, you know, greater local collaboration is really critical for destination management and, and kind of investment facilitation. And we've seen this in Livingston as well and some of the work that we've been doing down there. How, how sometimes how challenging it is to really uh, get platforms together that enable destinations to work together. Uh, so maybe that's something that we can, you know, that we can, chat about and and it i think some of it is is just lack of familiarity with the industry to be very honest with you uh you know i mean if you as a local client or as a local agent can bring can bring you know greater numbers of of uh, clients to these to these destinations and locations you know i think then let's just let's just kind of collaborate and engage in this and, and you know prove it in some senses that this is a better model and it has a much more local impact than than using some of these big online OTAs. That, that's an interesting area for Prospera to kind of explore a bit more about. Um, yeah, Carrie, I, you you just you just linked one of the the website that I that's popped up just since COVID, uh, and I would encourage everyone to look I at this. I started it last year. Yeah. yeah, it's been you know, and I'm I don't know. I, mean, I, I assume it's been quite uh, successful for you. Very, but it just, very, it, yeah. It, it outlines what opportunities are available and what local rates are available for Zambian residents. Um, and I've seen it grow over time, you know, and I think there's a lot of, often a lot of complaints that, uh, you know, the Zambian tourism offer is quite elite and quite expensive and inaccessible for the average, you know, the average Zambian. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in that issue and on that issue, but there are opportunities to travel um, Discover Zambia uh, on, on Instagram and the work that they're doing in digital marketing, I think is increasingly highlighting some of these, some of these domestic travel opportunities. And also, I mean, and indirectly investment opportunities, which is, which is exciting for us. And obviously the work that Intan has done on this resident safaris page, you know, there are, there are really some things, interesting things happening in the sector that, that, you know, in the in the context of COVID, are really starting to push and I think drive um, some in, some improved changes in the in the overall sector itself. Uh, Melinda says, for small business owners with viable and scalable products looking to partner on the distribution and export level, looking for financial backing, what would be the next steps to get the process going? So basically, basically, uh, there's a business. It's, it's operational and they're looking for financing to scale, right? I mean, this is exactly what ICA is, is designed to do, right? Um, so, I mean, engage the ICA crew, engage with Prospero crew and, and just, you know, take that first step just in kind of reaching out and, and talking about what you're looking for, what your business is, uh, you know, where the growth opportunities are and when what your plan is to, to you know, capitalize on that. 
and then we can, you know, then that will help us to kind of put you in whatever the appropriate size bucket is uh, for kind of further support on that, you know, whether it's technical assistance that, you know, really will help you to refine your business model or it's investment readiness, like the ICA uh, process is, is kind of all about. So that's that would be my recommendation on on that question there. Um, how are we doing on time? We got about five, six minutes left. Does anybody have any final questions or comments to, to wrap things up? Um, I would just maybe um, like to say that um, with the maybe with the government and that trying to um, get involved and areas that need to be um, explored. There's so many untapped hidden gems in Zambia, um, like you mentioned up um, north. They're just so difficult to get to. Um, a lot of them, the roads are pretty much non-existent. Um, and I, so it just makes everything for somebody to set up there pretty difficult um, for them to set up with the logistics, with everything, and to try and get somebody to, to go there, say just for a weekend. Um, for you to drive up north, it's going to take you two days to go up there. So there is a lot of opportunity for people along the way there, but um, we really need to um, find ways to try and improve um, the road networks, maybe the rail networks. Um, again, even the, the train that goes up to Tanzania, if there were ways that you could you could book that train and then you've got a guide that meets you in Impika and takes you from Impika up to Lake Tanganyika. I mean, Lake Tanganyika, everybody wants to go up there, but it's just so difficult to get there or it's really, really expensive. So there is a lot of opportunity out there, but, um, and then again, with the flights, um, the, the fuel, um, the av gas and all of that, that makes that so, so difficult. There were um, airstrips up north, but um, they're disused now and it just works out just too expensive. So a bit of support in those areas would probably help and maybe some um, decent luxury kind of coaches, not, not massive ones because we, we don't really have um, accommodation facilities that can fit 50 people in at a time. Um, but maybe with COVID, you could still use a, a 50 seater bus and you've got that little bit of um, distance in there. But Pam, along can the way- you, Can you do your COVID request since we've got the ministry with us? My COVID requests? Okay. <laughs> Captive audience. Yeah, All, right. Yeah. All right. So yes, one thing that we are trying to push, we have sent out a few um, emails and um, trying to get everybody to push it, is if we could have um, affordable rapid testing rapid. centers put up at all the travel hubs, um, your airports, your bus stations, the train stations, even at the park gates. Um, I think that way people will feel um, a little bit more secure um, traveling. Um, it's it'll be safer for the, um, the lodge owners and lodges, that as well. Staff. Um, the other passengers, yeah. your pilots, just everybody. And I think more and more we've lost so many bookings just recently because people are panicking to travel um without a test um so i think and people can't afford to go and pay over 2000 kwacha for the pcr so if there was an affordable 500 kwacha um rapid test that you could have done at the airport you do it an hour before you're supposed to board right you're negative you get on board and somebody needs to sit there give you an official fit to fly maybe you have a little health book or something but, and I think that will also work with the international market as well, realizing that we are being pretty serious about it. They need their tests to come into Zambia. Um, and throughout Zambia, you, you're still being, being tested. I mean, that, that's even potentially a, an investment opportunity for someone, right? I mean, yeah. 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 You know, working with the government on on that, I think we're you know I'm in discussions with somebody who's who is looking at that kind of something similar to that. 
as kind of a you know potentially a PPP arrangement or or, or a private clinic or something like that. So most definitely. Um, I guess just before we wrap up, everyone, I, I did, there was a couple of things I did want to highlight. I think someone mentioned that there's a there's just big opportunities in kind of the, both the urban tourism, you know, capitalizing on on the international traffic that does come in and out, but also a lot of the business mice tourism that comes in and out. There's plenty of uh, opportunity for you know afternoon events or evening events or you know services around that. Um, and also, you know, engaging with kind of artisans. Like, I don't know if, if, if some of you are probably aware of Lusaka Collective, others may not, but you know, their little area in, in Long Acres, they have a much bigger vision that uh, to kind of develop that area into more of it, an artist of love and kind of an urban ethnic uh, stop, you know, tourism kind of stop. And there's so many opportunities for this type of thing. Um, you know, that, that serves both the domestic market and, and the international market that I think is really, you know, key to look at. So these are just some relatively small ideas uh, that, that invest small scale entrepreneurs or small scale investors could really start to look in and, and Prospera would be happy to kind of engage and connect with, with you around those ideas and see if there's something that, that we, could, we could all come around. Um, I'm getting I'm getting the prompt that everyone needs to go back to the main room. So that's probably where we need to leave things. But very thanks very much to the panelists. We we appreciate your engagement and your insight and your recommendations. Um, and then just a final note: don't click the button to leave the room, not to leave the overall system. <laughs> I see it down in the blue room. But thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.